obviously pressure, volume, and temperature, which are three sort of common properties, obviously that we deal with in terms of gases. Uh, we talked about some units of gas and three very common units are tor and millimeters of mercury. Uh, tor and millimeters of mercury are essentially equal to each other. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. And an atmosphere is the other sort of unit of uh, pressure that we commonly use. And one atmosphere is equal to 760 tor. So that 760 number is an important sort of conversion factor uh, to convert our pressure into the proper units. Um, we also saw some other types of pressures as well. Uh, things like PSI, also bar, uh, kilopascals. But really, for the most part, uh, atmospheres, tor, and millimeters of mercury are usually going to be the uh, sort of three units that we will commonly um, sort of use in calculations, uh, sort of in chemistry here. We also talked about the barometer. The barometer is really sort of how we measure atmospheric pressure. And sort of an old school barometer is basically a pool of mercury uh, with like a glass tube in it. And again, as the atmospheric pressure basically exerts on the mercury, uh, the mercury goes up the column there. And that's why we get those units like millimeters of mercury, uh, because you can literally kind of read it like a ruler, uh, how high the mercury is in the column. Another sort of uh, common sort of tool that's sometimes used to measure gases or the pressures of gases is uh, monometers here. And there's kind of two here that we see uh, when we look at this. Uh, we have this guy here, it's kind of a closed system up here. So no atmospheric chemistry, uh, no atmospheric pressure happening there. So kind of a closed system. And basically, if you do an experiment or generate some gas, obviously the gas comes through the tube and starts to push the mercury here. And we basically can measure the height of the mercury in the column. And in this case, because it is a closed system, the pressure of the gas there will be equal to basically sort of the height, if you will, or the pressure associated with that height of that column. Uh, you can basically measure the height of it like in millimeters, and there's a certain amount of uh, millimeters to mercury sort of conversion, you could actually convert it into sort of a pressure. And over here, we have more of an open system. Uh, and in this sort of open system, in addition to the gas obviously pushing the mercury through here, we have the atmospheric pressure basically pushing back down on the mercury in the column in, in that particular case. So in that particular case, we do need to sort of take into account sort of the atmospheric pressure as well. So the pressure of our gas would be basically the pressure of the height of the mercury and also sort of the addition there of the uh, atmospheric pressure basically pushing back on it. So these are two sort of common uh, tools that are sometimes used to measure um, sort of pressure in an experiment. Again, by basically moving the, uh, the mercury through the tube and measuring the height of it. So we're gonna start talking about some gas laws here. And as I mentioned before, really those three variables are, are what we're gonna see in these gas laws a lot. And again, those three variables are P for pressure, V for volume, and T for temperature. And in certain cases, we may keep perhaps uh, one of these constant and vary the others. Um, and that gives us sort of our different sort of gas laws. And in this particular uh, situation we're looking at here, we're gonna look at really pressure and volume, keeping temperature constant. And as we will see, this is really what is known as Boyle's law, is that relationship. And if we look here at our, uh, our little columns here, we see that over here we have 100 milliliters of volume and this is sort of our pressure. When we drop the volume to 50 milliliters, we can see that obviously the mercury rises and the pressure rises, and we drop it all the way down to like 33 milliliters in this particular case, we can see that the pressure of the gas rises even more. So the relationship that we see with Boyle's Law is, is really what we see here and what it says on the bottom. It's basically sort of an inverse relationship. Basically, as one goes up, the other goes down. So as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down at constant temperature and vice versa, as the pressure goes down, the volume goes up. 
you could probably sort of logically just think about what's happening here if we have a large volume for our gas molecule basically to fly around. They obviously have a lot more room to fly around, so it's going to take longer for collisions to occur. Longer it takes for collisions to occur, less collisions will occur, and the pressure will go down. And that is different than when you, if you took that same, say, three gas molecules and you dropped it down into a, a smaller volume, you can see that basically they don't have as much room to fly around in. That means that we would expect a lot more collisions. And it's these collisions that really do obviously affect the pressure. And we would expect the pressure basically to start to rise in this particular case uh, because of that. So that's basically Boyle's law relationship there. Pressure goes up, volume goes down, and vice versa in that case. And we could actually see it here in these two graphs as well. Um, on the left there, we have, uh, as the pressure goes up, we have a very small volume happening. As the pressure goes down, we have a much larger volume happening. And again, here's our sort of inverse relationship that's happening here. One goes up and basically one goes down. Now, if you take the pressure times the volume in sort of a constant temperature situation, you will sometimes see P times V equals K. And this is what is sometimes referred to as a, a proportionality constant. It basically just means that if you took it, this sort of reading here for a particular gas, if you took basically the pressure and volume readings for the gas all the way through and you multiply them, they basically would come out to the same number always. And it's basically a constant number for that particular gas. And because that is like that, we basically can set both of these guys equal to each other. And this is really what we call Boyle's Law here. And Boyle's Law, again, is our P1V1 equals P2V2. This, again, is at constant temperature. And again, as we talked about the relationship that we see, one goes up, the other goes down, and obviously vice versa in this particular case. In terms of units, it uh, doesn't really matter in terms of units. Uh, pressure can be any unit you like as long as they are both the same. Volume as well can be any unit you like as long as they are both the same. So they just need to be the same units on each side. And again, that's mainly for everything to sort of properly cancel out. Any questions on that there? So why don't you try one here, see what you come up with. A sample of chlorine gas occupies a volume at 946 milliliters and a pressure at 726 millimeters of mercury. What is the pressure if it goes to 154? Okay, so let's take a look. So a lot of times, uh, although we've only talked about one gas law at this point, um, a lot of times it's really good to just kind of pull out the information from the problem. It usually will kind of lead you to sort of the right uh, gas law. So obviously we have a volume that's 946 milliliters and a pressure that is 726 millimeters of mercury. And we wanna know what the pressure is if the volume ends up at 154 milliliters. So again, you could really see hopefully sort of Boyle's law here. So 
you could call the first set of information ones, the second set twos. And obviously we would use uh, P1 V1 equals P2 V2. Here we're solving for uh, P2. So we want to divide V2 to the other side. And that gives us P1 V1 over V2 equals P2. In terms of units, we're good here. We have milliliters on both sides for the volume. Our pressure is in millimeters of mercury, which means that's what it will be when we're all done. And that would give us 726 millimeters of mercury uh, times 946 milliliters divided by 154 milliliters. Milliliters are gonna cancel. Again, our millimeters of mercury are gonna be here. And it looks like we end up About 4460 millimeters of mercury. Any questions on the calculation here? Again, it's important to understand sort of the relationships. It can sort of help you understand if your calculation went right or wrong. So what we see here in terms of the volume is the volume went from 946 to 154. So the volume went down, which means we would expect the pressure here to go up. So it went from 726 to 4460. So it definitely did go up. So again, it does make sense, sort of our answer. Any questions on that particular one? Um, in terms of milliliters, if we were asked for volume and it was something like uh, 4,400, 460 uh, milliliters, would you just want us to convert to liters or would you rather give what we were told, even if it didn't tell us what to give? Yeah, so in, in the case if it didn't necessarily tell you what to give in terms of units, uh, you really can give it any unit you want. And most likely it'll probably be whatever the other volume unit was is probably what you would leave it in. Um, unless it specifically sort of asked you for it in a specific unit, you obviously should convert it to that. but. Uh, in most cases, like I said, if it doesn't necessarily tell you the unit and you have one volume, usually people will just leave it in whatever that unit is for the other volume. So if the other one was milliliters, you would leave it, or liters, you would leave it. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. So I want you to try another one here, see what you come up with. Got a balloon, it gets inflated. Yada, 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 oh, that's the balloon. Okay, let's take the uh, same approach here. So we got uh, volume that is 0 0.55 liters at sea level at one atmosphere. Again, one atmosphere would be a pressure here. It goes to 6.5 kilometers, which is like useless information. We really don't need that. Uh, the pressure then goes to 0 0.4 atmospheres. And we are looking for a volume here. So again, you could hopefully see Boyle's law and we'll just call those guys ones and those ones twos. So in this particular case, we are solving for V2. So we'll divide the P2 to the other side, P1, V1 
uh, divided by P2. In this case, our pressures are both the same units, so that's all good. So that's going to give us uh, one atmosphere times our 0 0.55 liters divided by our 0 0.4 atmospheres. Atmospheres are going to cancel, and we will get 1.4 liters. So as was the question just a second ago, in this particular case, we would probably just leave in liters since this guy was in liters, you know, unless it asked for something specific. Again, if we look at sort of our trend, we see here that the pressure is going down, which means we would expect the volume to go up. So it started at 0.55, ended at 1.4. So again, that all makes sense in terms of what we expect it to do. Any questions on that particular one there? Okay, so that is Boyle's Law, that is pressure volume. We're holding our temperature constant. So we're now gonna talk about a situation here where we're gonna look at volume and temperature and we're going to hold our pressure constant. So if we look at volume and temp, holding our pressure constant, we do get a relationship uh, which is known as Charles Law, as we'll see. Very badly written W, try that again, there you go. And Charles Law is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And again, this is at constant pressure. So because it's at constant pressure, what that means is if we raise the temperature, we would expect the gas molecules to start flying around a lot faster. They're obviously gonna pick up a lot more energy and we would expect a lot more collisions basically to occur. And if we did have a lot more collisions occurring, we would expect the pressure to start to increase. But since we're going to be keeping this at constant pressure, the way we're able to do that is as we increase the temperature, we're gonna have everybody flying around faster. So what ends up happening is the volume starts to increase with it. And by increasing the volume, what that does is it keeps the number of collisions relatively constant, and it also will keep the pressure constant. So the relationship that we see here is, is pretty much what we see in these two pictures. Uh, when the temperature increases, the volume will also increase with it again. That's really how it's able to maintain its temperature or maintain its pressure. And that's what we see here at a low temperature. We have a sort of uh, small volume and at a higher temperature, we have a larger volume the pressure, which is represented here by the mercury, is the same in each, basically. And uh, we see that adjustment. And that also means that if we decrease the temperature, so if we lower the temperature, what we would expect to happen is those gas molecules now will have less energy, which means they're going to be flying around a lot slower. It's going to take longer for collisions to occur. And again, if nothing happened in that situation, we would expect the pressure to start to drop. So in order to keep the collisions up and constant, what ends up happening is the volume actually decreases. So as the volume decreases, it pushes all those gases closer together and keeps the collisions happening at the same sort of rate and keeps the pressure constant. So in Charles law, which is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, basically as one goes up, the other goes up. And as one goes down, the other one goes down. Now, we also have another sort of relationship that's very similar to Charles' law that we will also see here. And that is what is known as Guy Lussac's law. And and under Guy Lussac's law, what we have is P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. And this is actually at constant volume. So in this situation, what happens is our gas molecules are pretty much stuck in a container where the volume is not going to move. So in this particular case, because the volume really doesn't adjust like it does with Charles law, when we increase the temperature, again, we would expect the gas molecules to fly around faster. We would expect an increase in collisions and we would expect the pressure to go up. So in this sort of relationship, as we increase the temperature, 
we would expect the pressure to increase as well. Again, here, the volume is not adjusting to account for that. And vice versa, if we lower that temperature, everybody's gonna be flying around a lot slower, gonna take a lot longer for collisions to occur, and we would expect the pressure actually to go down. So sort of the same relationship, if you will, between these two sort of gas laws. Uh, again, just what's being held constant is different between them. Uh, as one goes up, the other goes up, one goes down, the other goes down. Any questions on those two there, or the relationships there? Okay. Now, in addition here, when we look at sort of this relationship, especially the volume temperature relationship, in Charles Law, and if we do sort of a graph of volume versus temperature for different gases, and we sort of make these nice little straight line graphs like we see here, no matter what the gas is, if you pretty much take that line back to the temperature, it always hits the exact same spot. And it always hit that at this spot, which is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. And that number may look familiar to you because that is the number that we use to convert to Kelvin in terms of temperature. And Kelvin understood this relationship and called that what is referred to as absolute zero. Because if you take minus 273.15 degrees Celsius and you add 273.15 to it to convert it to Kelvin, you get zero Kelvin, which is referred to as absolute zero. So Kelvin pretty much understood that relationship. And basically what that means is every time you're using a gas law and you see temperature, you need to convert it to Kelvin. So it definitely needs to be converted to Kelvin anytime there is a temperature involved in the gas law. And again, 273 plus Celsius gets you to Kelvin. And that goes for both of the ones that we just saw, Charles Law, V1, T1 equals V2, T2, Guy Lussac's law, P1, T1, equals P2, T2. And both of these equations on both sides, temperature definitely needs to be in Kelvin if you want to get the right answer. Yes, so you got to make sure that you do that there and have it into Kelvin. Now, even on problems where, and this sometimes happens, they will give you the temperatures in Celsius, They'll ask you to give the answer in Celsius and people sometimes mistakenly think, oh, well, they gave it to me in Celsius. I could give the answer in Celsius, so I'm good to go and I could just put it in Celsius into the gas law. And you cannot do that. So you need to convert it to Kelvin. You need to put it into the gas law and then you need to convert it out of Kelvin back to Celsius or something like that. So again, sometimes and it's very common, you'll come across some questions like that. Um, and again, because you're sort of given it in Kelvin, I'm sorry, given it in Celsius and asked for the answer in Celsius, people sometimes think you can do it in Celsius. So definitely if it's a gas law, you should probably be using Kelvin. Otherwise you will probably get it wrong. Any questions on that there? Has it never been negative 300 degrees Celsius? Is that what that means? What's that? There's never been a time where anything has gotten to negative 300 degrees Celsius. I, I don't think so. In, in theory, I guess. I guess in theory, you could probably do it, but uh, I, oh, really? I, I personally don't recall, but I guess, I guess that's what that means. Sort of the lowest temperature you could kind of sort of reach in, in that sense. Uh, technically zero, Kevin. All right. Probably need some sunblock at that point. I don't know if it's very cold. <laughs> All right, so why don't you give this one a go here and see what you come up with. Uh, we got carbon monoxide at 3.2 liters, 125 degrees Celsius. Uh, what temperature will it be? 1.54 liters.
Okay, so let's take a look. So again, I would take the same sort of approach now that we've got a few different gas laws to think about. Uh, we have a volume that is uh, 3.2 liters. Uh, we have obviously a temperature that is 125 degrees Celsius. Uh, we are looking for another temperature. And we have a volume that is 1.54 liters. So again, you hopefully should be able to kind of see Charles law there. V1 T1 equals V2 T2 in this particular case. So again, you could call these guys the ones, these guys the twos. Now, in this case, we are solving for our T2 since again, this was at constant pressure. And again, you would be multiplying the T2 to the other side, multiplying the T1 to the other side and dividing by the V1. Now, rearranging some of these equations is sort of difficult sometimes for people. So, you know, sort of a quick way is anytime you obviously that you move across the equal sign, uh, that guy ends up in the opposite location. So if it was up on top over here on the left, it will end up on the bottom right and vice versa. If it was up on the right, it would end up on the bottom left there. So basically you just move things across and that's sort of a fast way you could kind of rearrange it. So since I want to solve for T2, I basically am going to move the T2 across and that gives me T2. I then need to move the T1 across and the V1 across as well. And that gives me our V2, T1 and V1. So again, basically just cross it over. It's a quick way to kind of do it. You're basically multiplying and then dividing obviously mathematically what you're doing. In terms of units, we're good in terms of the volume. They're both in liters, but our temperature here does need to be in Kelvin. So we do need to add a 273 to that. And that's going to give us, looks like 398 Kelvin. And now we're ready to put everything in, hopefully. So T2 would equal our V2, which would be 1.54 liters. Our T1, which again converted to Kelvin, 398 Kelvin. And our V1, which is uh, 3.2 liters. Again, here the liters are going to cancel, going to leave us with Kelvin. Uh, so if we multiply this out here, we got 154 times a 398 and divided by 3.20 gets us something like a 192 Kelvin in this particular case as our answer. And we can first off any questions on that there. We could also look at our relationship just to make sure it all sort of makes sense. We do see that our volume went down and that means that we would expect the temperature to also uh, go down as well. So again, if you subtracted 273 from this, I think you get something like 81.5 degrees Celsius, which is obviously a decrease in the temperature as well. So again, we do see the correct sort of relationship uh, based on Charles law. Any questions on any part of that there? All right. Give the next one a go, see what you come up with here. 452 in a light bulb goes from 22 to 187, what are we looking at in terms of the final volume here?
Okay, so same idea here. Uh, we got uh, 452, which is a volume. We got a temperature of uh, 22 degrees Celsius. It then goes to a 187. And we are looking for another volume here. Uh, so again, we could kind of see our Charles Law here. I count, I think that's one and one there. That's a twos. So that's going to give us uh, V1, T1 equals V2, T2. Here we are looking for V2. So basically, we're going to move T2 to the other side. And that will give us T2, V1, T1 is equal to V2. We do need to do a couple things here. And again, basically our temperature. So uh, we're going to do a little 273 action there and add it up. And that gets us 295 Kelvin and a 273 on this side, maybe a 460 Kelvin. We now got everybody in the right units. Uh, we just want to make sure we get everybody sort of on the right side there. So we're going to start with our T2 up on top, which is 460. Uh, we have our V1, which is 452. And going to divide it by 295, which is our T1. Again, the Kelvin going to cancel. The only unit left here is milliliters. So that will be our units at the end. And it looks like perhaps 705 milliliters in this particular case. Again, if we kind of look at our relationship that's happening here, we see our temperature is increasing. We would expect our volume to go up as well. And again, we do see that when we compare where we started with to where we ended. Any questions on that calculation there? All right, one last one here. See what you come up with, argon. We got uh, 1.2 atmospheres at 18 and it goes to 85 degrees. What is our new pressure here? What does it mean to be inert? Uh, it means it, it's not it's not very reactive. So like the noble gases aren't very reactive. That's why they're called noble gases and kind of like noble metals like gold and stuff like that. So 
they're virtually unreactive. They do react with themselves, but pretty much nothing else. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so on this one, if we kind of pull out the information, uh, we got 1.2 atmospheres, which is definitely a pressure. And the temperature is 18 degrees Celsius. The temperature then goes to uh, 85, there we go, 85 degrees Celsius. And we are looking for a pressure here. So again, if we kind of look at this, obviously Boyle's law is not gonna do you any good since there's no volumes. Charles law is not gonna do you any good. Again, there's no volumes involved. So we do wanna use Guy Lussac's law, which is our P1, T1 is P2, T2. Uh, like normal, anything involving temperature, we are going to need to convert. So might as well just do that right up front. Looks like a 291 on this Kelvin. And if we add 273 here, looks like maybe a 358 Kelvin. Our unit on pressure is okay. It just means that when we do solve for pressure, it again will be in atmospheres. So basically we need to uh, solve for P2. Uh, so we're just gonna move really our T2 across and up and that will give us T2 P1 T1 is equal to P2. Here again, we just wanna make sure we get the right temperatures on the right spots. Very common people kind of reverse things when they get on to do these gas laws. So uh, 358 should go up on top. Our pressure should be 1.2. And our first temperature there should go on the bottom. Again, our Kelvin's gonna cancel, gonna leave us with atmospheres and looks like perhaps it is a 1.48 atmospheres. Any questions on that one there? Again, we could look at our sort of relationship and make sure it makes sense. So we are seeing that the uh, temperature is increasing. So we would expect the pressure to increase as well. And again, we do see that as we go from 1.2 to 1.48 in this particular case. Question on Charles Law, Guy Lussac's Law, uh, Boyle's Law, any of those laws so far? Okay, so we definitely have a good amount of laws to keep going with. So let's go talk about the next gas law, which is our good friend Avogadro. He had a number, but hey, he wanted a gas law too, and why shouldn't he have one, I suppose? So this is Avogadro's law. When we think about Avogadro's number, uh, we think about moles. So it would make sense that uh, Avogadro's law does involve moles. And when we talk about moles of a gas, that is what N represents. So N represents the moles of a gas. And when we're dealing with uh, Avogadro's law, this is at basically constant temperature and pressure. And we get this relationship that we see there. V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. So that is volume over moles equals volume over moles. And again, this is at two sort of constants, constant temperature and pressure here. So one aspect of, of Avogadro's law, and you could definitely just use it as sort of Avogadro's law, like any other gas law, obviously at constant temperature and pressure, you got a couple of volumes and some moles, you can figure out the moles. Um, if you know the couple of moles and a volume, you can figure out the volume and really just kind of plug and chug sort of into it. Uh, but another sort of aspect of Avogadro's law where we will see uh, an opportunity to maybe use this again is in sort of stoichiometry problems that involve gases, and especially stoichiometry problems that involve gases uh, that are under constant temperature and pressure conditions. And the normal sort of relationship that we do when we look at a balance equation is again, we take those coefficients and we basically could say something like what we see there that you know, three molecules of H2 react with one molecule of N2 to give us two molecules of NH3. We could also use that mole to mole relationship like we did in stoichiometry and say for every three moles of H2, it reacts with one mole of N2 and gives us uh, two moles of NH3. 
And we can also add to this sort of mole to mole relationship, molecule to molecule relationship. We can actually add sort of a volume to volume relationship when we're dealing with gases under constant temperature and constant pressure. And that's because basically as the volume changes, the moles basically change pretty much proportional to it. And what we could do is, for example, in this equation, we could actually come up with three sort of volume to volume relationships, very similar to how we do mole to mole relationships. We could say from this equation for every three liters of H2, we react one liter of N2. And again, that's almost identical to how we do the mole to mole relationship. It is just a coefficient in the balance equation. We could also say for every three liters of H2 we toss in there, we get two liters of NH3 out. And for every one liter of N2, we get two liters of NH3 out. And we could use these just like we would use a mole to mole relationship. We could say for make two conversion factors, say three liters of H2, one liter of N2, or one liter of N2 up on top, and three liters of H2. The benefit of this is uh, it will sometimes allow you not to have to use maybe a gas law to solve a stoichiometry problem. Uh, again, if you're at constant temperature and pressure, you can almost use your volume to volume relationship again, very much like your mole to mole relationship. So to kind of see how that sort of works. And again, like I said, you could also just plug and chug into that equation like any other gas law and solve for something. So for example, if we look at this and we see this equation here and we wanna know how many volumes of NO are obtained from one volume of ammonia, um, we can do that because again, we're at constant temperature and pressure here. We could look at those two things and that is ammonia and NO and we could find the relationship between them. And really from the relationship, we see that there is four liters of NH3 for every four liters of NO. And really just like our mole to mole relationship, we could write our two conversion factors from that, four liters of NH3 over four liters of NO, our opposite there, four liters of NO over four liters of NH3. So even though it's really a gas problem, even though you, know, you could perhaps do this in a um, gas law type situation with stoichiometry, we could actually do a fairly simple sort of stoichiometry problem here. If we started with one liter of NO, I'm sorry, one liter NH3. We could then use our conversion factor and that would give us four liters of NH3 is four liters of NO or a one-to-one -one relationship. And we would expect one liter of NO out to be produced. So this is sort of a, a consequence or a byproduct of the relationship that we have with Avogadro's law. Again, basically the volume and the moles are almost proportionally related to each other. As one kind goes up, the other one goes up with it and sort of proportion wise. And again, you could kind of do a stoichiometry problem without having to necessarily use a gas law here to help you solve it. Any questions on that there? Okay. So looking at some of the relationships that we've talked about so far, again, we saw Boyle's law and as one goes up, so as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down and vice versa. And looking at some of the other ones that we talked about, kind of Charles law and Guy Lussac's law, again, as the volume goes up, so does the temperature. And as the volume goes down, so does the temperature as well. And our pressure temperature relationship, again, pressure going up, so does our temperature and our pressure going down, so does our, our temperature as well. And Avogadro's relationship there basically the volume and the amount of gas at constant temperature and pressure, we see a pretty equal sort of relationship in terms of the volume and the molecules of the gas that are there. And if we kind of put all these gas laws together, if we combo our Boyle's or Charles or Avogadro's law and put them all together, we get the granddaddy of them all here, which is the ideal gas law. And that is our PV equals NRT. 
And this is the ideal gas law, which is basically a gas law that describes an ideal gas. And we'll talk really what sort of makes something an ideal gas a little later on in this chapter, but an ideal gas is kind of something that pretty much may be near other gases, but it's not really dependent on other gases is sort of by itself, even though it's not by itself in a sort of ideal situation. One thing that we'll see about uh, the ideal gas law here that's different than the ones that we've seen up until this point is it's really sort of a one and done situation. There's no like two pressures, there's no two volumes, no two temperatures. We have just like one pressure, one volume, one temperature or something like that. The other thing that's really important in terms of the ideal gas law is out of all the gas laws, it is the most restrictive in terms of units. So when you use the ideal gas law, everybody has to be in the correct units for it to work out correctly. So P is pressure and it has to be in units of atmospheres when you use the ideal gas law. V is volume and the units that you need for the ideal gas law is liters. So the volume always has to be in liters if you're going into the ideal gas law. N should be moles, unless you did something weird, that should still be moles. And T needs to be in Kelvin, like pretty much all gas laws. And really the reason why it is so restrictive in terms of the units is because of what R is. R is the gas constant and R has a value of 0 0.08206. And the units that it has is liters times atmosphere divided by Kelvin times mole. And that's essentially why everybody else here needs to be in those units for everything to cancel out correctly. Some people will round this 0 0.0821. You could use either one. I personally uh, use the 0 0.08206 because that's kind of what they beat in my head and I can't get it out as much as I try. Uh, so I always use that number, but sometimes people will round it and sort of use it uh, as a rounded number. Again, should get you pretty close to the same number uh, regardless there. So we do want to use ideal gas law whenever, uh, you know, we have kind of one situation happening, one of everything. And you should always remember that you always do have this R value. It is a constant. Uh, you do always have it available to you. Not in all problems will they say, hey, here's R. You just assume that you know you have it sort of available to you. Another sort of important relationship uh, that we see with gases is what is referred to as STP. And STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. And when they tell you it is at STP or the gas is at STP, they are actually giving you a temperature and they are giving you a pressure. So at STP, that means that the temperature is 273 Kelvin and the pressure is one atmosphere. So again, in a problem, if they say, hey, what is, you know, the volume at STP. That means you actually do have a temperature and pressure given to you. Now there's kind of a nice little relationship that occurs when you are at STP conditions. And that is this relationship right here. Basically one mole of any gas will have a volume of 22.414 liters, sometimes referred to as the molar volume of the gas. This you could use as a conversion factor, but you could only use this when you're at STP conditions. So if you're not at STP conditions, you definitely should not be using that as a conversion factor. Why would you maybe want to use it as a conversion factor? Well, it can allow you not to have to use the ideal gas law in the calculation. You could actually just use this if you're at STP conditions and might be a little bit quicker and less room for error perhaps. The good news is, even if you are at STP conditions, if you're on non-STP conditions, you could 100% always use the ideal gas law. So you could always just put the numbers, the 273, the one atmosphere into the ideal gas law. Everything will come out the same. But again, if you find yourself at STP, you know you might want to try this conversion. It might be a little quicker. But again, if you can't remember it, I'm not sure you should use it you could always use ideal gas law, even if you are at STP conditions. And really that is how we get our value for the gas constant. 
So if we kind of solve the ideal gas law for R and we put in all of our values at STP, and that's pretty much what we're looking at here. So again, at STP, uh, we have one atmosphere. The volume would be 22.414 liters. We would have one mole and the temperature would be 273. That again, is essentially how we derive our gas constant. Also how we end up with all those units because none of them cancel out, obviously when we divide. And that's how we do end up with really all those units for our gas constant. Any questions on that one there? So why don't you give this one a go, see what you come up with here. We are looking for the pressure uh, exerted in this situation by 1.82 moles, 5.43 liters, and 69.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's uh, pull out the information here. We are looking for a pressure. Um, we do have moles, which is N. We do have volume, which is 5.43. And we do have temperature, which is 69.5 degrees Celsius. So again, you could really see, we, we pretty much have one of everything. You could probably almost see the ideal gas law there. So the ideal gas law would be pretty much what we would wanna use here. Uh, we got PV equals NRT. Uh, we do have the volume, the moles. We always have R, even though it wasn't given to us. And we do have temperature, so we can solve for P. Again, R is that constant, 0 0.08206. So in terms of units, we're good everywhere, again, except for like normal or temperature here. So we do want to add 273 to it. And that's gonna give you a temperature of 342.5. And now if we take our PV equals NRT and solve for P, we're gonna divide B to the other side. And putting in our numbers here gets us 1.82 moles, or 0.08206 liters atmosphere Kelvin mole. 
our temperature at 342.5 Kelvin, all divided by our volume of 5.43 liters. In terms of units, moles will cancel, Kelvin will cancel, liters will cancel. I'm gonna leave you my really scribbled atmospheres as the only unit left up there. And it looks like we will end up with 9.42 atmospheres. Any questions on that? Yeah, R will probably be given to you on the exam. Um, truthfully, you'll probably use it by then enough that you'll know it anyways, but it'll probably, it should be up there. Again, though, as you go through other problems, uh, just remember that you do have it. You know, it's not necessarily usually given to you in problems. Other questions on that? So this is ideal gas law. Other variations is they don't necessarily give you the moles, but they oftentimes may give you grams. So a lot of times here, we do need to use molar mass to convert to moles. So that's another sort of variation, very common sort of uh, calculation that occurs. All right, why don't you give another one a go here and see what you come up with. What is the volume in liters occupied by 49.8 grams of HCl? H is uh, 1.008 and CL is 35.45 off the periodic table. All right, so see what you come up with here.
Okay, so let's take a look and see what we got going on here. So we are looking for a volume occupied by 49.8 grams of HCl. And we're at STP. So a reminder, STP does actually uh, mean a temperature and pressure. So our temperature would be 273 Kelvin. Our pressure here would be one atmosphere. Um, so again, if you're looking at it, you got a PV equals NRT type of approach. Uh, we do have the pressure, we do have the temperature, uh, we do have R. We don't have N at this point, but we do have something that is just as good, which is grams. So we can definitely get the moles. And we could use the ideal gas law here. So if we took that approach, uh, we would get the moles of HCl, and that would be 49.8 grams of HCl. Going to the periodic table, we would see uh, one hydrogen at 1.008 and 3545 for our chlorine gives us 3646 in terms of the molar mass of HCl from the periodic table. Dividing that out gets us something like 1.37 moles. That again is sort of the last thing we would need for using the ideal gas law. Solving for V, which is what we're looking for, uh, we would get NRT divided by P and putting in our numbers 1.37 or 0 0.08206 and our temperature of 273 Kelvin. Again, all divided by our pressure of one atmosphere. Again, atmospheres cancel, moles will cancel, Kelvin will cancel. We are left with liters at this point, and that would get us 1.37 times 0.08206 uh, times 273. Looks like 30.7 liters would be our answer here. First off, any question on that calculation there? Now, you could have, if you wanted to, solve this another way. And maybe some of you did, some of you hopefully maybe realize again, we are at STP conditions. So when we're at STP conditions, we could use that conversion factor we talked about. So here we are at STP which means that one mole of a gas will equal 22.414 liters, which means essentially as soon as we actually calculated the moles here, we actually could have went right into the conversion factor and we could have took 1.37 moles of HCl. And again, using our conversion factor because we are at STP, one mole would equal 22.414 liters moles would cancel and we should end up hopefully with the same answer and we do 30.7 liters so again in this situation this does show you what we were talking about earlier you know if you remembered and you wanted to you definitely could have just went with this approach here using that conversion factor again if you didn't remember the conversion factor or wasn't sure you should use it, you can obviously, as you can see here, even at STP conditions, you're good to go with the ideal gas law. They both will give you the same answer. Any questions on either of those sort of approaches there? And again, one last reminder on that, you can only use that conversion factor under STP conditions. Any questions on that there? Okay, so uh, we have not talked about enough gas laws yet. So let us continue our ever journey here of gas laws. So why not have a gas law that involves everybody? Pressure, volume, temperature. Let's all just do it together here with all three of those variables. So if we actually solve the ideal gas law for R and R is our constant and we solve it for kind of two different conditions, uh, because these dars are really the same number, we could essentially put both of these guys equal to each other. 
And if we do that, we get this relationship here, which is P1 V1 over N1 T1 equals P2 V2 N2 T2. In most of the cases though, the number of moles of gas really doesn't change because you know, you don't open up the lid usually, right? So if you don't open up the lid, the gas is probably not gonna change. So these guys essentially remain constant as well. And that brings us to what is sometimes referred to as the combined gas law. And the combined gas law is our P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. Everybody here is pretty much the same as we've talked about before. It doesn't matter the units of the pressure or volume as long as they are the same units on both sides. And like normal, our temperature here with our combined gas law does need to be in Kelvin. So we wanna make sure temperatures in Kelvin, but really pressure and volume can really be in any unit you want. This again, I would say is the one that gives people probably the hardest time rearranging and kind of screwing up on the rearrangement there. So again, this might be the one where it's just easier to kind of move things to opposite locations as you go across that equal sign uh, to do that. This is also a really good one to remember in terms of a gas law, because uh, you know if you don't want to remember all the other ones for the most part, um, T1 equals P2, V2, T2. So for example, if you didn't want to remember perhaps say Boyle's law or Charles law or Guy Lussac's law or even really um, Avogadro's law, you can use this because under Boyle's law, we're at constant temperature. So you basically just scratch out the temperature and there is Boyle's law right there. If you were at Charles law, Charles law is constant pressure. So if you scratch out the pressure, there's Charles law right there. You know, uh, Guy Lussac's law is at constant volume. So again, if you cross out the volume, there's Guy Lussac's law. And really this relationship down here, is under constant pressure and temperature for Avogadro's law. So if you scratch out the pressure and the temperatures, there's Avogadro's law. So the combined gas law is a nice one. You can remember it and pretty much just scratch out whatever is being held constant and it will really get you to sort of the gas law that you need really quickly. Um, it's a good way to sort of remember those other ones if you don't wanna kind of memorize them, just remember this one, scratch out what's constant. Any questions on that there? Uh, this one has what name? This is the combined gas law. So this is sometimes referred to usually as the combined gas law. And again, uh, that's the one that pretty much has everybody in it. Technically, it has the, the moles in it, but pretty much every one is usually constant moles. So that we don't, we usually look at it in terms of this one down here, that P1, V1 over T1 uh, and P2, V2 over T2. And um, again, that's a good way to kind of get you to all the other ones. Other questions on that? Yeah, I had a question. Um, in the first exam, you talked about uh, Millikan's uh, oil drop and Rutherford's experiments. Will you test, on, test us on like the name and what the gas law looks like? Or will you just give us examples to do? It's a, it's a good question. Um... I think you should know the names of the, of the gas laws to go with it. Um, and there might be like a multiple choice question that says something like, you know, what is the relationship in Charles law? So you probably need to know what it is. Uh, most of the sort of the problem base, you really don't need to know the name. You just kind of need to kind of know the relationships, I guess. Um, but, you know, you could potentially have questions or come across questions like that uh, where people sort of uh, use it, you know, kind of ask a question based on the name of it, like, hey, in Boyle's law, you know, is it an inverse relationship or something like that? So I would say it's probably good to kind of know the names to go with them as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? All right, so I want you to give one a go, see how your rearranging skills are working for you today. Consider this one of oxygen gas. We've got 27 degrees, 9.55 liters, 297 atmospheres. And we do some changing there. What is our new volume? Let's see what you come up with. Uh, this one, is it also important that we turn to Kelvin? 
Yeah, pretty much uh, any gas law, you got to get it to Kelvin, yeah. Okay, let's take a look since we're getting to the end here. So if we just kind of pull up the information like we've been doing, uh, we got a temperature that's 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, we got a volume that's 9.55 liters. And we have a pressure that is 2.97 atmospheres. We have another pressure that is 8.25 atmospheres a volume we're looking for and a temperature of 125 degrees celsius so again on temperature we, one, i'm sorry uh did, on temperature one did you mean 27 i probably did thank you 
so 27 looks good. Uh, so here we can kind of see that we really do have sort of our combined gas law, our P1, V1, T1 equals P2, V2, T2 in this case. Again, you could kind of label all these guys ones, all these guys twos. In terms of units, we got atmospheres on both sides here. So that's all good, like everything else. Now we got the right temperature there. So uh, let's go with a 273 on that to 300 Kelvin. And our 125, again, adding the 273, gonna get us, uh, we got there 398, I think. That's what I got. Yep, perfect, 398 Kelvin. Uh, in this case, we are solving for V2. So again, in terms of just quickly rearranging this, we're going to bring the T2 to the other side, which means it will go up on top. We're gonna bring the P2 to the other side, which means it's gonna go on the bottom. And if we rearrange it that way, that should give us T2, P1, V1 divided by V2, T1 is equal to V2. So again, here we wanna make sure that we get everybody sort of in the right area. So on top is T2, which is our 398, and P1, which is 297, 2.97. And our uh, V1, which is 955, divided by our V2, which is not V2, uh, that should be P2 if I actually wrote it right there, divided by P2, which would be 8.25, and our T1, which is 300 Kelvin. There we go. Since we are solving for volume, that would make more sense. Our atmospheres are going to cancel. Our Kelvin are going to cancel, going to leave us liters, which is good because we're looking for a volume and looks like perhaps 4.56 liters in this particular case. Any questions on that particular one there? So again, I would say this one a lot of times does give people a hard time, really the rearranging. And a lot of these gas laws, the rearranging part does give people difficulty. If that is your uh, a problem for you, make sure you take some time to really figure out how to properly rearrange things. Uh, I think maybe there's a question before or not, but uh, you don't necessarily have to rearrange it. You can just plug the numbers in and mathematically solve it, which is kind of the same thing anyways, whichever way you're more comfortable doing it. Any questions on any of that there? All right, we're gonna wrap up a lecture here for now.